Hello, everybody. Welcome to Grand Rounds on this uh, Monday afternoon. Happy to have all of you with us and happy to have Samira Farouk, who, as many of you know, is the, an assistant professor in the Division of Nephrology and of Medical Education, the Associate Director of the Nephrology Program, the Nephrology Fellowship Program, um, and an expert in caring for kidney transplant patients with both acute and chronic conditions and does a lot of work in medical education at all levels with medical students and residents and fellows, has received multiple awards, and uh, also near and dear to our heart is the Director of Social Media for the Division of Nephrology. Um, and we are happy to have her here today to talk about what to expect when your patient has a kidney transplant. Dr. Farouk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Weissman, and uh, thank you, Ryan, for the uh, kind invitation to speak about a topic that I'm very passionate about that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, and so um, I don't have any financial relationships or anything to disclose for this talk. And so um, I know y'all have interviews today. And so for the interest of time, I'm just going to dive right in. Um, I do have my eye on the chat. And so please feel free to share any questions or comments that you have, and I will um, be happy to address those. So I wanted to kind of frame this talk uh, with a case and um, uh, put everything else that I wanted to share in the context of that case. And so um, this is a real patient of mine um, with some identifying details that um, changed. I'm a 65 year old woman with a diagnosis of RPGN, rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis due to ANCA vasculitis. Um, she was started on hemodialysis via a perm cath or a tunnel dialysis catheter. She's been on dialysis now for about eight months, and she's coming to see me in my, uh, what we call the initial clinic for initial kidney transplantation evaluation. And so when I was a resident, and I know many of you are residents, kind of what happened in the process of organ transplantation was a bit of a black box for me. Um, I knew that we, you know, when certain criteria were met, certain individuals were referred for different organ transplant, whether that was heart, kidney, or liver, and then we kind of send them to the transplant specialist, and then not really sure kind of what happened after that until maybe they would come back to the internal medicine service and be admitted to my team as a resident. And at that point, I didn't really understand a lot about what had changed post-transplantation and what I should think about differently when I was caring for these patients. And so with that in mind, I have three objectives for this talk. And so the first is gonna to be to hopefully help you understand the journey from a patient from dialysis to kidney transplantation and beyond. Second is to review some common post-transplantation challenges. And finally, what I think is maybe most important and helpful is how we can co-manage patients with kidney transplants together, um, internists, uh, other specialists, how we can all work together with our transplant care team to provide the most safe and effective care for this uh, unique patient population. And so before we get into this, why kidney transplant is, and is this even a, a form of treatment that is accepted? And so um, I would just take my word for it that kidney transplantation is the preferred treatment modality for the majority of patients with end-stage kidney disease. Of course, there are exceptions to that rule, but I'm going to show you some data here to prove that there we do have strong evidence that those patients that receive a kidney transplant do have lower uh, long-term mortality. And so this was a study from 1993, so fairly old at this point. And the pink dotted line is the reference, so that's mortality for patients on dialysis. And you can see that regardless of your cause of chronic kidney disease, you have decreased mortality. Um, and this is uh, showing about two and a half years of follow-up. A similar analysis was repeated in 2018, so a bit more, a bit more, um, or more current. And you can see here that after that initial uh, increase in mortality in the first few months post-transplant, and this takes into account post-transplant complications, any pre-existing comorbidities, soon after that, there is a significant decrease in the mortality of these patients. And this graph goes out to five years, but if I could extend this out to you for 10, 15 years, I'm pretty sure that that curve would really below that. And so when I see a patient with chronic kidney disease that is approaching dialysis, one of the questions that I always want to know is how do I get this patient to successful kidney transplant? And what are some of the factors that we should consider as we prepare for that process? And so once we do a successful kidney transplant is at the end of the road. Unfortunately, kidney transplants at this time don't last forever. And this is recent data from the SRTR or the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients showing that regardless of your cause of kidney disease, one year survival is excellent. And even up to five years, graft survival is, is over 75%. And so when my patients ask me when I'm evaluating them for a kidney transplant, how long will this kidney transplant last? There, I tell them that one, that 
depends on several factors, which we'll discuss over the course of this talk. And two, it depends on the type of organ that they have. And so in general, what do I say? I say that it depends, but in general, maybe somewhere from 10 to 15 years, if everything goes well with that kidney transplant. And so I like to put this into context of history a little bit. And so transplantation, where did it come from? And when did we start doing this? And so this actually is not a new concept. And so the first transplant that's documented in history probably happened somewhere between the third and fifth century. We don't know exactly when, but there were these two saints who were Arab doctors practicing in Syria. Their names were Cosmos and Damien. And several centuries after that, maybe in the 13th to 14th century, artists began to depict what they thought had happened during this first transplant transplantation. And you can see here that the first transplant was a limb transplant, and they took the, the leg of this individual that had passed away and transplanted to this patient who was hypothesized to have had a cancerous or gangrenous leg or something like that. And so very, very early on in our history, there was this concept of how can we replace organs that no longer function from those that have deceased and, and may have organs that are acceptable quality. And so again, these saints, we would think that they would be very revered. They had this amazing idea and they actually did many other um, you know, activities that would be considered to be pioneering in the field of medicine. However, they were a bit ahead of their time. And I wanted to point out there's, there's a urine bottle here. And so urine has been very, very important since the beginning of time. As a nephrologist, I love urine. And so unfortunately, these individuals were not viewed very highly and they were actually beheaded because of some of what they had done in medicine that was considered to be kind of out of the realm of what they should be doing. And so soon after that, they was soon recognized how important and pioneering their work was. And now they are seen in a bit of a different light in modern society. And so where does kidney transplant come in? And so unfortunately, kidney transplant didn't start until the 18th century. And so I'll show you a little bit of where we started with kidney transplant and where we've come. And so the first kidney transplant was actually attempted between a dog and a dog and a dog and a goat. And these were not really that successful. And there were different animal human combinations that were tried over the next several years. And then ultimately the first human to human transplant was attempted in 1933. It didn't work. And that was our first sign that there was there was something that was different between the donor and the recipient, and that was when we first learned about the ABO blood system, which is incredibly important for transplantation. We always try to ensure that our donors and recipients, other than some, you know, um, small extenuating circumstances, do have an ABO blood type match, and that's to prevent uh, severe rejection by the recipient's immune system. And so let's fast forward a little bit to the first successful human transplant. And so this actually happened between identical twins. Here they are here. They were a bit older when they had their transplant. I think they were in their early 20s. And this was done um, at uh, Mass General Hospital um, in Brigham and Women's on uh, uh, Christmas Eve Eve, which is in a couple of days. Um, and uh, important to know that the recipient actually did very well. His kidney transplant lasted a long time. And his, his twin brother, who was a donor, did very well, but actually did pass away from end-stage kidney disease somewhere in his late 70s, which is sounds alarming, but actually is probably something that may have happened even without the donation of this kidney. Um, and so how does the magic happen? And so if we're talking about how can we know what to expect when we are treating a patient with kidney transplant, anatomy is incredibly important. And this is something that I didn't even really understand until I did my first kidney transplant rotation as a nephrology fellow. So this is a cartoon depiction of the anatomy here. And so just to orient you here, we have the native kidneys. And so this is the one on the right. This is the one on the left. You'll notice that they're crying because they're approaching end stage. And so this is a transplant kidney here. And so if I'm the kidney transplant surgeon, what am I going to do when I get this organ? I'm going to make three connections. The first two are going to be the donor's blood vessels. And so the a connection between the donor and recipient artery, as well as the vein. And the third connection is going to be between the donor's ureter and the recipient's usually bladder. And so already we can start to think about some, some issues that a kidney transplant patient may have, just specifically thinking about the anatomy here. And so if there are any issues with this artery to artery anastomosis or vein to vein, that may predispose the patient to something called transplant renal artery stenosis, which can also happen in the native artery. But remember, that we only have one transplant here. And so this one artery now may become more susceptible as we don't have another kidney that can kind of help us out. If the vein, vein thrombo vein vein anastomosis has any challenges that may predispose to thrombosis of that renal vein if the blood flows are too low. And then finally, the ureter bladder 
um, and astenosis can present significant GU uh, challenges for patients in the future. So this may be um, intermittent obstruction, they may, may be predisposed to urinary tract infections, this graft ureter no longer has those urethral urethral valves, which keep the urine flowing in the right direction. And so you may end up with stagnant urine that may predispose these patients to urinary tract infections. So coming back to our case here, um, so now, you know, coming back to this initial transplant visit. And so what's going to happen at this initial transplant visit? What is, am I going to, how am I going to tell this patient what their next steps are? Are they going to get on the wait list by the end of the day? And so just to kind of backtrack for a second, so who do we see in, in our initial transplant clinic? Our criteria are pretty simple. Anyone that has had one EGFR value of less than 20. And we actually may see patients prior to that if their EGFR trend or slope looks like it may be approaching that less than 20 number soon. And why do we use that number? That those are the criteria from the from UNOS that allow listing of patients on the kidney transplant wait list for deceased don donor transplant. And so when they come to see us for this initial visit, it's, we tell them to anticipate to be with us for several hours. And why is that? Because they have to meet our entire team. And so this is a really a team effort. This is a 360 evaluation of the patient that not only includes a thorough medical evaluation from me, where I'm talking to the patient, trying to find out as much as I can about their medical history, which sometimes can be challenging if they come to my office without any sort of paperwork, and trying to uncover any reasons why they may not be an optimal candidate for transplantation history of malignancies, infection, what are the medications that they're on, what is their native kidney disease, what is the risk that that may come back in the transplant. They'll also meet with our transplant surgeon. We have a coordinator that will explain to them in depth the entire process, social work evaluation, dietitian. They'll also have financial clearance. And so this is really a, a, a team process and everybody is, is vital to making sure that we do a complete evaluation of this patient. Once this evaluation is completed, if we do think that they are an acceptable candidate, we try to assess at this visit or begin to assess, does this person have what we call potential living donors? And so living donor is the ideal uh, form of uh, treatment for end-stage kidney disease. And I'll show you a slide about how we try to optimize the chances that someone may have a potential living donor. And so living donors tend to perform better than deceased kidney donors. If we think about it physically, living donors are coming directly out of the donor within a few minutes, they're being taken to the OR where the recipient is, and then within 30 minutes or so that kidney is going to be hooked up and working. If we're talking about a deceased kidney transplant, it may be up to 24 hours from when that organ is procured to when that organ is going to go into the recipient. And so when patients tell us that they don't have anyone in their family that's a blood type match for them, we, we try to encourage them to participate in something called the SWAP program, where they may have a living donor that is, is healthy and willing to donate, however, is not a blood type match for them. Another pair of individuals may have a similar circumstance. And so this is called paired kidney donation or the kidney swap chain. And so you can see here that by having individuals with different blood types, we can find a way so that everybody gets a living donor at the same time. And then the next question about the donor is how compatible are the recipient and the donor beyond blood type matching? And here's when we talk about HLA typing. And so I'm not going to go into that in detail today. Um, it's not kind of out of scope of what I'm trying to discuss today. But the HLA typing and how close the match two individuals are can help us answer the question of how likely is this recipient to reject this donor in the future? And so already thinking about kind of post-transplant concerns, this pre-transplant concern is incredibly important as we try to to establish what we call immunological risk. And so just to give you a scope of the spectrum here, if we're talking about two identical twins, they would be the most similar and they would have minimal immunological risk compared to two individuals that had completely different HLA typing. And that might be someone that might have a higher immunological risk and may require higher doses of immunosuppression after the transplant is completed. The recipient and donor evaluation processes are long. Again, we're trying to make sure everything is as perfect in these individuals as they can be, because we know that if there's something wrong beforehand, it can become much worse after transplantation. Again, related to the immunosuppressive medications that we will be giving to these patients. And so not only age appropriate screenings, but also cardiac testing to make sure that they will be able to handle the surgery itself, as well as a, th as well as a thorough viral screening for viruses like HIV, HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, tuberculosis, syphilis, 
um, anything that we can think of, we, we will screen for as a part of this process. And so coming back to our patient here, so she underwent a successful initial evaluation. She completed all of her testing, did not need any follow-up testing. And her husband actually uh, came forward as a living donor for her and she received a successful kidney transplant. And based on their HLA typing and some other pre-testing that we do pre-transplant was thought to be low immunological risk. She had immediate allograft function. Allograft is a term that we use for the kidney transplant and a ureteral stent was placed that is usually kept in for a few weeks and that's to help that anastomosis that I described between the ureter and the bladder um, help that heal a little bit better. Her perm cap was removed as she would no longer require dialysis and she was discharged on hospital day four. And so how is she now different now that she has a kidney transplant? And so on the left side here, I have an individual pre-kidney transplant. They take some medications for whatever medical conditions they may have. They're on hemodialysis. And now after the kidney transplant, some of those medical conditions likely have not gone away. And so they'll likely need to continue some of those medications. They have this new kidney transplant. And then I think what I, my, one of my main points of this talk is to get across is that what makes the transplant patient different is the medications that they're on. And so the majority of what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk is what are these medications and what are some of the challenges that they can present for kidney transplant patients, even though they're doing their job to protect the kidney from the immune system and episodes of rejection. And so let's take a look at this patient's discharge medication list. And so this is a very long medication list. None of these medications were being taken by this patient prior to transplant. And so something that, that we have to counsel our patients about prior to transplant is this laundry list of medications is coming. Oftentimes patients may feel that once they have their kidney transplant, all their medical problems have gone away and they're going to leave the hospital off dialysis without any pills. And so it's very important for patients and their families and caregivers to understand this before we move forward with the transplant so that they are prepared to be able to deal with these long um, list and, and frequent medications. So to help with this, this is a, um, a picture of a sheet that we actually give all of our kidney transplant patients. Um, and before they leave the hospital, they actually participate in several classes with our kidney transplant pharmacists to help counsel them about how to take these medications, why do they need them, and um, we encourage them to ask them any questions that they may have. And I think what's really helpful here are the pictures of the pills, as we often have patients that will come into our office and tell us that they had problems with the, with the pink pill, and without this sheet, um, I'd probably be lost to know what that pill was. And so we can separate these medications into two different types. And so these first three, we will we'll call the immunosuppressants. And then the others are there for prophylaxis to prevent complications of the medications or prevent infection that again, are likely could be related to the lower immune system as a result of the administration of immunosuppressants. So when we think about immunosuppressions for our patients, how do I decide? How do I know how much immunosuppression someone needs? And I know that if I have three patients in front of me, all three of them probably will need varying degrees of immunosuppression that may change over the lifetime of their kidney transplant. And so this is all really about balance. And so the two things that I'm trying to balance are one, I'm trying to prevent rejection as best as I can while keeping in mind the tolerability of these drugs. And as I'll show you in a few slides, these drugs have significant adverse effects. And then I'm also trying to minimize the occurrence of malignancy, drug-drug interactions, infections, and nephrotoxicity, which all may result as a, um, as a consequence of taking these uh, medications. And so again, we can spend a whole hour talking about immunosuppression and immune system regulation pathways. And so I'm just gonna show you one slide here to tell you that this is a, a blue cell here is a T cell and all of these little white boxes here are different drug targets that have been designed based on our understanding of how T cells are activated. And so the first step into an organ being rejected, whether that's a kidney or a heart or a liver, is that the T cells and the immune system must be activated and then go to that transplanted organ and then cause, cause injury and damage. And so immunologists and researchers have been able to boil this down into three steps. And so we have signal one, which is basically when this antigen presenting cell brings a foreign protein to the T cell and says, hey, look at this. I don't think this belongs here. And this then triggers two other signals that ultimately lead to the transcription of genes that cause inflammation, 
have more T cells that get activated and ultimately can cause a lot of badness in the kidney transplant. And so again, our understanding of these pathways have led to the design and testing of immunosuppressants that have been used in kidney transplant. And so I'll quickly take you through the journey of immunosuppression and kidney transplantation. In the last 50 years, it's come, 60 years almost, it's come a long way. And so the first attempted immunosuppression was total body radiation. And so that sounds really extreme, and it was. It didn't work very well, but it did deplete all the immune cells. And so for a short period of time, yes, you will not have rejection in your organ, but of course there are more systemic effects that led to um, high mortality in these few patients in which it was attempted. In the 60s, steroids and azathioprine, which is an example of an anti-metabolite, it interferes with DNA synthesis and thus T-cell proliferation. That was a mainstay of therapy for several, for several years. However, kidney transplantation experienced high rates of rejection and both short-term and long-term survival were not very good. And then slowly over time, we began to develop more and more potent immunosuppressants. And so without going into the details of all of these, I want, would like to draw your attention to mycophenolate, mofetil, and tacrolimus, as those are the backbone of the majority of kidney transplant recipients that you'll likely see. And at our kidney transplant center here at Mount Sinai, our protocol for all of our patients, unless there is a reason to do something different, is to discharge all of our patients with these two medications, plus or minus um, a steroid, depending on, on the individual. And so again, tacrolimus is an example of a calcineurin inhibitor. The abbreviation for that is FK. If you ever read a kidney transplant progress note, unfortunately, we love to use tons of abbreviations and acronyms, and so FK is one of those. MMF refers to the anti-metabolite, which has actually been shown to be better than azathioprine. So you won't see very many patients anymore on azathioprine. And then finally, some of our patients may be on a steroid for different reasons. Um, and so this patient was discharged with five milligrams of prednisone. And for her, the real reason was her history of ankyovasculitis. When patients have a glomerulonephritis, oftentimes we may keep that steroid on to lower the risk of disease recurrence in the future. And so calcineurin inhibitors are the backbone of most immunosuppression regimens in the United States. And so you can see here that the blue, the green, and this uh, teal line are all regimens that contain um, calcineurin inhibitors. And so you can see here that as of 2018, over 60% or almost 70% of individuals were on a regimen that did contain tacrolimus. And so tacrolimus is a drug that you'll see not only in kidney transplant, but commonly used for heart and liver transplant. And so just quickly to share the mechanism of how this works, it's one of my you know, favorite drugs to talk about. So this is a diagram of a T cell and now we're inside the cell. And calcineurin here is an enzyme which is called a phosphatase. And it removes a phosphate group from this protein that's called nucleating factor of activated T cells, which it does what it says it does. It causes gene transcription that allows a T cell to become active. And so here are different inflammatory genes and cytokines that help this process of activation and inflammation. And this happens normally when our body is trying to exert an immune response against bacteria or viruses. And so what happens when we have a calcineurin inhibitor? So calcineurin is no longer able to bind and remove this phosphate group. So the activating factor of T cells is now trapped in the cytoplasm, and then we no longer get this T cell activation. And so in our patients with kidney transplant, we monitor calcineurin inhibitor levels by checking what we call a trough that is measured 30 minutes before the morning dose. And when we have therapeutic levels, we're able to decrease this process by about 50%. And so why do the drug levels matter and why do we care about them so much? And so the reason that we regularly monitor drug levels are that many factors can cause the levels of the calcineurin inhibitors to change. And what's most important for other uh, members of the patient's care team are that calcineurin inhibitors are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system in the liver, particularly the enzymes 3A4 and 3A5. And so why does that matter? If you give that patient other medications that interfere with this system, then you are going to directly impact your calcineurin inhibitor levels. And so medications that are CYP3A inducers are going to lower the level of calcineurin inhibitor, while inhibitors are going to raise the levels of calcineurin inhibitor. And so both subtherapeutic and supertherapeutic levels come with their own challenges. And so that's why we work very closely with other members of the patient's clinical care team to try to minimize 
these interactions, or if there is an interaction that cannot be avoided, we have to make sure to adjust the dose of the calcineurin inhibitor um, respectively. So for example, if I have a patient that is going to be receiving rifampin for some reason, and this I know is an inducer, I may have to preemptively increase my calcineurin inhibitor dose to ensure that I'm going to remain within the therapeutic range so that I don't precipitate a kidney transplant rejection. Ritonavir, which is a commonly used protease inhibitor in patients with HIV, is a potent CYP3A inhibitor. So patients that are on ritonavir as part of their antiretroviral therapy regimen may be on very, very, very low doses of calcineurin inhibitor, again, because the metabolization pathway has been interfered with. And so calcineurin inhibitors are great. They have significantly lowered the rates of rejection. Almost all of my kidney transplant patients are on them, but unfortunately they come with a lot of downside and they come with a lot of adverse effects and challenges. And much of what I do in my post-kidney transplantation visits is try to mitigate some of these adverse effects or treat them when necessary. And so unfortunately here are the, all the different ways that we might think about calcineurin inhibitor adverse effects. Unfortunately, they are nephrotoxic, which which my, my friends that are not in medicine always ask me, why are you using a nephrotoxic drug, drug in patients with kidney transplants? That doesn't really make sense. These drugs are cardiovascularly toxic. They have significant metabolic toxicity. They can cause many different electrolyte disorders, neurotoxicity such as tremor, the drug-drug interactions which we spoke about, and specific calcium inhibitors may actually cause gingival overgrowth as well as hair loss or hair growth. And so we were so intrigued by the number of these um, adverse effects. Well, then my, my former co-fellow, Josh Ryan, and I actually wrote this review, um, and our title got a lot of attention, in which we covered all of the different side effects of calcium inhibitors. And the first line of this review that we wrote is, calcium inhibitors are both the savior and Achilles heel of kidney transplantation. And so as you'll see in the next few slides, this drug is a really great drug to do what we wanted to do to prevent rejection. But unfortunately, it comes with a slew of issues that may May also contribute to a patient's morbidity and mortality. And so this figure here is comparing the different adverse effects between tacrolimus and cyclosporin. And so the boxes that are more to the right are more common with tacrolimus. Those that are to the left are more common with cyclosporin. And here you can see the spread of all of the different adverse effects. And so while we always start with tacrolimus as our drug of choice, and that's because it has been shown to be superior in kidney transplant outcome studies, we might decide to switch to cyclosporin if there is an effect of tacrolimus that we are trying to avoid. So for example, example, NODAT, which is a fancy way of saying diabetes after transplantation, has been reported to be a bit more common in patients with tacrolimus. So if this does become a significant problem, we might consider changing that patient's drug regimen to cyclosporin. And so Every kidney transplant patient's immunosuppressive regimen is, is generally very, very thoughtful and changes have been made for a particular reason. And so when you're meeting a kidney transplant recipient for the first time, going back and kind of seeing what has happened in that kidney transplant patient's course can be very enlightening into why those drugs have been selected. And so let's talk for a few minutes about the nephrotoxicity. Um, and so unfortunately, calcineurin and neuron inhibitor, inhibitors are potent vasoconstrictors. And this is a nice electron micrograph of a glomerulus here. And this AA is the afferent arterial. So if you can think back to medical school, the afferent arterial is the one that's providing the blood to the glomerulus and contributing to our glomerular filtration rate. When I give this patient a calcineurin inhibitor, unfortunately, this artery becomes vas very vasoconstricted. And so you can see how at very high calcineurin inhibitor levels, I may expect to see acute kidney injury or rise in the creatinine because of this acute um, drop in the GFR. And so this diagram is to show you the wide range of nephrotoxicity, unfortunately, that is associated with calcineurin inhibitors. We can divide these into acute versus chronic, and there are different pathologies that we can see in either the acute or chronic stage. And so if we were to kidney do kidney transplant biopsies in patients that are five years out from transplant on a calcineurin inhibitor, close to 100% of those patients would have some evidence of calcineurin inhibitor toxicity on these biopsies. So this is a challenge that we deal with every day with our patient population. And so what can we do to mitigate this? We can try to lower the doses and trough level targets as possible, again, while keeping in mind the risk of rejection. So, in general, patients with kidney transplants 
um, the graph tends to do pretty well. And actually, when they pass away, most of them actually do have functioning kidney transplants. And so one of the major causes of mortality similar to the dialysis population are cardiovascular causes. And so unfortunately, calcium inhibitors are associated with not only diabetes, but also hypertension, dyslipidemia, and hyperuricemia, which are all known cardiovascular risk factors. And so the mechanism of the diabetes is a little bit interesting. And so the calcium inhibitors are actually thought to be directly toxic to the beta cells that, that uh, produce insulin. And that along with some possible synergistic effect with steroids may make these patients a bit less resistant, less sensitive, I'm sorry, to insulin. And so generally when we have patients that are pre-diabetic or have other evidence of metabolic syndrome prior to transplant, we're almost certain that when we put them on a calcium inhibitor that they will develop diabetes afterwards. And another interesting mechanism is that if you think back to that nuclear factor of activating T cells that we spoke about, it's actually not only present in T cells, it's actually also present in beta cells and needed for insulin release. So it makes sense that when we give patients calcium inhibitors that they have some challenges with their glucose metabolism, which may be in part explained by the um, maybe suboptimal working of the beta cell to be able to synthesize and release insulin. And so here you can see the calcium inhibitor that is limiting the efficacy of nuclear factor activating T cells, or maybe here activating factor of beta cells. And then the end goal of that is decreased insulin production. And so the same pathway may explain the, the hair loss. Some of the patients on tacrolimus may experience alopecia. This is thought not really well understood, but may be related to NFAT. There also may be some sex hormone imbalance that occurs on, in these patients. The reverse actually happens in patients on cyclosporin. and they actually can develop hirsutism. And again, not very well understood, but maybe thought to be related to um, NFAT toxicity in the cells that are responsible for producing hair and leading to the turnover of those hair cells. And so how do we treat these? And so unfortunately, I don't have a lot of novel options the options to treat these issues are going to be the same that you would do for patients without kidney transplant. The only thing that we would keep in mind would be any potential drug-drug interactions. And so antihypertensive in general, we love to use calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors once patients are a few months out of transplant, beta blockers if they have additional cardiovascular risk factors. Um, we try to have all of our patients on statin and aspirin. Exercise is beneficial just like in the rest of the population. And of course, insulin and other agents to try to achieve optimal glucose control, which we often do in conjunction, in conjunction with an endocrinologist. And so I have to talk about SGL2 inhibitors. As nephrologists, we have become a bit obsessed with these. And these are some figures from the DAPA-CKD trial, which I'm sure many of you have seen. And these, the, the dramatic separation between these curves are the composite outcome of cardiovascular mortality and kidney outcomes with the, with the red line being the placebo group and the blue line being the dapa gliflozin group. And so can we use these drugs in kidney transplant? This is an immunosuppressed population. And in some of these uh, SGL2 inhibitor trials, there have been reports of urinary tract infections and genital mycotic infections. And so is that risk worth this dramatic reduction in cardiovascular and kidney outcomes? And so uh, Joel Toff, who's someone that I work pretty closely with on Twitter, actually posed this question to our NEF Twitter community and said, in a patient with type 2 diabetes that has a GFR greater than 60 and a kidney transplant, would you use an SGL2 inhibitor? And out of over a thousand people, the overwhelming majority said yes. And so do we have data in this population? We do, it's a bit limited. There are some case series with short-term follow-up, um, but the take-home message um, that I wanna share with you is that it's probably safe. Um, it's likely to be equally efficacious and beneficial given what we know about the pathophysiology and what we think is causing these positive outcomes. But do keep in mind that in this study of about 50 patients, two patients did have repeated urinary tract infections as well as as urosepsis. And so as in the non-transplant population, we have to choose our candidates for SGL2 inhibitors very carefully. So I would not choose someone that has a history of recurrent UTI or someone that has had other evidence of um, that would predispose them to infection. 
And so kind of coming back to these, is there anything that we can do to get away from calcineurin inhibitors? Are there any better drugs that have come out? And so, yeah, so in 2011, um, we had the, um, the birth of Belatacept, which is a co-stimulatory blockade agent, which basically is a fancy way of saying it's able to kind of damp down the stimulation of the T cells. And rather than being a pill, this is a monthly infusion that our patients would come in for. And how does it do when it's put head to head with a calcineurin inhibitor? And so this is a pretty famous graph now from the benefit trial, which compared a calcineurin inhibitor to belatacept over seven years, which is a pretty long outcome. And the y-axis here is the GFR. So you can see here that in the calcineurin inhibitor group, the GFR uh, actually seemed to go down a bit. Whereas in the Belatisep group, the GFR not only did it not go down, but it looks like maybe there was even a little bit of an increase. And so Belatisep provides this kind of fantasy for us as kidney transplant uh, doctors to see a world with calcineurin inhibitor free regimens. And so while that has not become the standard of care, we are increases, increasingly starting to use Belatisept in this patient population when patients do not tolerate calcineurin inhibitors um, and those reasons may be any of those six adverse effects that I, that I just described. And so if you do end up taking care of a patient that's on Belatacept, what's the more, most important thing to do is to see when was their last dose and when are they due for that next dose. We really try to make sure that patients don't miss these doses and we can give it to them when they are admitted as long as they don't have an active infection or other reason not to. And so coming back to, my, to our case here, and so now this patient is four months out of transplant, her creatinine came down as low as 0.8, and now it's gone up to 1.3. She's asymptomatic, she's euvolemic, so she has an AKI. And so what do we do with a kidney transplant patient that develops an AKI? And so I'm not going to talk about all the native causes of kidney disease, but just keep in the back of your mind that all of those can happen. But the mnemonic that I use to teach AKI specifically in the transplant is CRAB. So CRAB is not just for multiple myeloma. I've kind of taken it over for kidney transplant. And so the C stands for calcineurin inhibitor toxicity. I've shown you the many, many mechanisms by which that can occur. The R is for rejection. I'm a, I'm a kidney transplant nephrologist. I'm always sniffing around for rejection. And that R also stands for disease recurrence. And so if I have a primary glomerular disease, that can always recur. And depending on the disease, that may occur more or less frequently. The A is for anatomic. Again, remember that, that ureter to bladder connection. Is there something wrong there? Do I have an obstruction? And the B is for BK virus, which I'm going to get back to in a second, or other infections. Infections can always infect the allograft and cause an infectious nephropathy. And so here is a normal looking kidney ultrasound and there's no hydronephrosis here. So I think I'm good with obstruction. I look at the urinalysis, there's some white blood cells. My tacrolimus trough level looks like it's pretty good at this, at this stage that my target is around eight to 10. And then as part of my protocol, I looked for BK virus and I found almost half a million copies. And so that can't be a good thing. And so we did a kidney biopsy and all these brown cells here, those are all BK virus inclusions. And so here I have a patient that has developed AKI in the setting of BK virus nephropathy. And so what is that? And so BK is a papilloma sorry, uh, polyoma viridae, and it's also a Popova virus, and it's named BK because of the first patient that it was isolated from, and it's in the family of viruses with JC virus and simian virus SV40, and so this is a problem that's pretty specific for patients with kidney transplant. It's completely asymptomatic, however, can, can present as acute kidney injury, and we can see evidence of that on the kidney biopsy. And so what are some other infections? And so there's a whole slew of infections that can occur. So not only those that can occur in the non-transplant population, but opportunistic infections as well. And what's important here is the timing. And so when I have a patient that has an infection less than a month after transplant, I'm not really thinking about opportunistic infections yet, but beyond that, I'm always going to have some of these atypical organisms always on my differential diagnosis. And so the treatment here is not really rocket science. If a patient has an infection, they are telling me that they are over immunosuppressed. And so that means that I must lower their immunosuppression. And so for this patient with BK virus nephropathy, I lowered the immunosuppression um, and I'm watching that virus slowly clear over time. Does that increase that patient's risk of rejection? Absolutely. And so if that patient does develop a rejection later on, then I have a more complicated clinical management scenario, but how much can I increase without having that BK virus come back and be a problem again? 
And so no talk I think would be complete with a bit of a discussion about COVID-19. Um, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time about what is going on in the, in the kidney transplant world and what should we think about when we see COVID-19 and kidney transplant patients. And so by now we all know that there is this mass inflammatory storm or cytokine storm or milieu or whatever your preferred terminology is that is happening in these transplant, in not only transplant individuals, but all individuals. And so what does that mean for these patients? So immunosuppressants are there to lower inflammation, lower cytokines. And so it makes sense that maybe if I immunosuppress a patient, perhaps I can get away from some of those negative effects of that COVID cytokine storm. And so there are some pros and cons of this, and I'll just tell you the punchline. I don't have the answer here, and we're actually doing things very differently across the world. So some reasons to not immunosuppress, well, obviously it's a viral infection. And so if I give immunosuppression, do I impair my body's ability to clear that? However, there's some compelling reasons to immunosuppress. I'm going to protect the kidney from rejection. I'm going to calm the storm. And I'm not going to show you the data here, but there have been some in vitro studies of other coronaviruses in which tacrolimus, Cellcept have been actually shown to have antiviral activity. And so there is a possibility that in these patients that giving these drugs may actually impair the SARS-CoV-2's virus's ability to replicate and to infect. Again, no human studies about that, but something that has been shown in in vitro basic science studies. So immunosuppression strategies have widely varied across New York and across the country and across the world. So these are some screenshots from different papers just showing you what types of strategies have been pursued. Some people have stopped all immunosuppression. Some, some people have stopped none of the immunosuppression. So what have we done at Mount Sinai? We have kept most of the immunosuppression and lowered our target levels for tacrolimus just a little bit, but we do think that some immunosuppression is potentially helpful and our patients overall have done pretty well. Um, and so I'm a part of this, a large kidney transplant consortium called the Tango Group. And uh, we actually had started this before COVID to study glomerular disease. And so when COVID started, we were actually able to take advantage of this cohort to study COVID-19 outcomes in a very large kidney transplant population of almost 10,000 patients. And so only about one and a half percent of these patients developed COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. And the mortality rate was not that different from the regular population, maybe a little bit higher. And this number has has been, has been reported to be higher and lower in different smaller kidney transplantation cohorts that's likely related to the composition of those cohorts. And so for now, the answer to the question, do kidney transplant recipients do worse? We're not really sure. We probably think it's a little bit similar and the presentation is, is probably also a bit similar as well, though there may be more of a subtle presentation in these immunosuppressed patients. And so we were one of the few centers that actually continued to perform deceased donor transplants during the pandemic. And so this is a visual abstract from a study that, that um, reported our results. And so we transplanted 30 individuals between January and April. And overall, the patients did pretty well, but there was some COVID and 13% and of patients actually required admission following their kidney transplant because of COVID-19. And so again, coming back to this, um, you know, how do we balance these adverse effects with preventing rejection and tolerability? And in the last few minutes here, I want to spend a couple of slides talking about malignancy. And so similar to infection, malignancy is a big problem in patients that are immunosuppressed. We lose our surveillance and thus tumor cells have more room to proliferate and to become a problem. And so I'm not going to go into the details of this figure here, but the takeaway here is that there are several factors that can that contribute to post transplant malignancy, not only immunosuppression, but also age, viral infection, and of course, DNA damage. So that can come from UV light, smoking or other factors that we may not yet understand. And viral infections are known to increase these malignancies. And so this table here is showing different viruses and the malignancy that they're associated with. And the one that you might hear us talk about a lot if you rotate with us on the inpatient or outpatient side is EBV and PTLD. And so EBV is Epstein-Barr virus and PTLD is just a fancy way of saying a lymphoma that happened after transplant. I don't think I figured that out until my second year of fellowship. And so this is a figure from the SRTR showing that the majority of patients with PTLD um, actually may be EBV negative. 
And so just because someone does not have a history of Epstein-Barr virus or active PCR that we can detect does not mean that they can have PTLD. And so whenever I can't figure out what's going on with a patient, PTLD always rises to the top of my differential because of the variability and heterogeneity of presentation. And so which cancers are more common here? And so PTLDs, which can happen anywhere in the body and non-melanoma skin cancers are probably the ones that we see more commonly and the ones that we um, are we're able to find. And so kind of with that being said, when, where, and how do we look for all of these malignancies? And again, like immunosuppression, this similarly has to be a personalized approach. And so for everyone, we would recommend age appropriate colon colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening. Special for the transplant population is that I recommend that all of my patients with kidney transplant have dermatologic screening every year, as well as we you know, instruct them to look at their own skin, to look for moles and things like that that may not have been there before. Um, and then other screening um, uh, tests would be kind of on a case by case um, basis. And so finally, uh, of course, in the news, vaccines have been all over them. And so what does that mean for the patient with kidney transplant? And so inactivated vaccines definitely should be given to all patients with kidney transplant. So which are the ones that are more common that we talk about? Flu vaccine, we really recommend every season. Pneumonia vaccine um, at the recommended intervals. Tdap, tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, we recommend in all of our patients. There's a little bit more controversy about when or if we should give live vaccines in patients with kidney kidney transplant, there is some data to show that they may be safe, um, but you will, if you ask, you know, 10 individuals that are infectious disease transplant specialists, I don't think there would be consensus about that. However, what about this new mRNA vaccine for SARS-CoV-2? Um, the guidelines from the American Society of Transplantation, which RMTI, uh, Mount Sinai's Kidney Transplant Institute, agrees with, are to vaccinate patients with kidney transplant with this vaccine, pre-transplant, post-transplant as long as they're at least one month out. And so our guidelines and our recommendation once the vaccine is available to our clinic will be to vaccinate as many of our kidney transplant patients as we can if they're willing to do so. Though these patients have notably been excluded from the vaccine trials, what we know about the vaccines suggests that there should not be any worse than adverse effects in those patients. However, we don't know how effective they will be because of course the antibody response may be a bit diminished because of the use of immunosuppressants. And so coming back to our patient one last time, and so what does her medication list look like now? Now she's at eight months post-transplant. She's still on tacrolimus. Her target trough has been lowered because she currently is uh, has BK virus still in the blood. She's completely off the anti-metabolite because when we had cut it in half, she still had BK that was persisting. Um, she's still on a little bit of prednisone. She will remain on Bactrim single strength daily, lifelong, unless she develops a reason not to. And that's to pr provide protection not only against pneumocystis, but also against nocardia. And then she remains on these prophylactic medications, Pepsid 20 milligrams daily, aspirin 81 milligrams daily for cardiovascular protection, and then finally Pravastatin 10 milligrams daily. And for her, she did not have history of coronary artery disease, so for her, these would be primary preventative measures. And then finally, when I see this patient for follow-up next week, here are the vaccines that we'll discuss. We'll talk to her a bit about the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. We'll counsel her to get that when it's available to her. We'll make sure that she has been offered the flu vaccine and then Tdap and pneumonia if those have not been completed at a prior visit. And so in summary, here are my three takeaway points. So one, kidney transplant does improve mortality in patients with end-stage kidney disease, but I do wanna emphasize that we do have to pick our recipients and our donors carefully. Kidney transplant is definitely not the right treatment strategy for everyone, but generally almost all patients with chronic kidney disease that are in that stage five, stage four area should be referred for evaluation. The majority of post-transplant complications are generally related to the anatomy of the patient. Again, remember that your ureter to bladder connection can cause a lot of problems down the line, as well as the immunosuppressants. And finally, malignancy and infection are always on the differential diagnosis. 
the, the why differential diagnosis in patients with transplant is one of the reasons that I was really drawn to this field. I love internal medicine. I love nephrology and transplant kind of brought all of those together with this kind of extra lens of immunology. And so when you see these patients, everything's on the table and remember that they're, the fact that they're immunosuppressed is, is probably contributing to something that's going on with them. And again, this is the slide that I can never get away from. Immunosuppression is always a balance. And in the course of a kidney transplant's life, over 10, 15, 20 years, their medications are going to change many times. And it's because we're always trying to balance the good of preventing, preventing rejection with the bad of malignancy infection and all of these bad things that can come with these medications. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and just a reminder that patients with an EG for less than 20 are eligible for kidney transplant listing. Please don't decide on your own that a patient is, is eligible or not. We would love to talk to these patients and, and evaluate them ourselves. And if you're not an organ donor, please choose to donate life. So I will stop there and take any questions that you have. And again, thank you for the invitation and to let me share some about this topic that I love. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was great. We have about four minutes. Um, so we'll open up to questions either in the chat or if people want to unmute themselves. I know there are some questions that you must have when that kidney transplant patient shows up on your list. Oh, Dr. Farouk? Yes. Uh, hi, this is uh, Shimi Patel, one of the hospitalists. I have a question um, regarding patients that come in with transplants. We expect their creatinines to be slightly higher than average. Does that really mean that I can't give them medications and I need to renally dose them? Because a lot of times I feel like there's confusion. I, I don't necessarily always con consider these patients um, with having like uh, CKD necessarily. Um, yeah, so that's, that's an important question, and I think, you know, appropriate right now, since we've recently removed the race coefficient for EGFR estimation. And so, um, so it's not true, actually, that kidney transplant patients have an, on average, higher creatinine. I have transplant patients with the creatinines of 0.6. I also have patients that their best creatinine after transplant is 2. And so every patient's GFR estimation has to be done individually. And so rather than do they have a kidney transplant or not, I would use that creatinine to try to estimate either their GFR or their creatinine clearance and then dose, dose the drugs in that way. But you're right that technically, if you have a kidney transplant, you by definition have CKD, but you may have you know, a GFR that's well over 60. Does that answer your question? Ah, uh, yes, thank you very much. Other questions for Dr. Farouk? Hi, it's Eve. I'm one of the hospitalists. Um, I had a question just in terms of usually we consult um, our, you know, in-house nephrologist if it's a kidney transplant. Um, is there, you know, an important role in reaching out to the primary um nephrologists in real time as well. Obviously, we always try to, but um, are there certain nuances that we might not be aware of that we'd be missing by not doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking that. Um, so at Mount Sinai Hospital, we've, we have two services. So when I'm on service, I have a primary kidney transplant service where we have patients that are here for transplant, donors, or anything within one year, treatment for rejection. We also have a consult service where we actually follow every kidney transplant patient in the hospital that we are called about. And so what is our role there? So we keep an eye on the immunosuppressants. We look out for drug-drug interactions. And so should you involve the patient's primary kidney transplant nephrologist, um, I would suggest doing that if it's possible. They generally may know things about the patient that you know the patient may not be able to tell you. Um, however, if that's not possible within the Mount Sinai Health System, them. If you just go back to the most recent um, kidney transplant progress note that should have the patient's kidney transplant life story. Um, however, if something seems a bit off with the medications or you're not really sure kind of what's going on with the patient, it can definitely be helpful to reach out to the, the transplant center. 
We also do monitor daily uh, tacrolimus, cyclosporin, serolimus levels for patients that have a kidney transplant that are in-house. So that's a big reason why we like to be involved because when patients are in the hospital, even if it's not related to medications, even you know, dietary patterns um, can affect trough levels. And so we can help ensure that the, the immunosuppressants are within the appropriate target during their hospital stay, particularly if it's a prolonged hospital stay. I think you might have answered everybody's questions. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank And we'll be in I've, touch. Yeah, thanks. Please feel free to email me with any questions or concerns and uh, hope to see you in person soon.